Thank you. Yeah, I know that's a that's a mouthful. Um, just uh, to where my brain is at and um, trying to think through uh, what I wanted to talk about this uh, today. This original idea, this idea was originally conceived somewhere back August of last year, and so I've been thinking had a lot of time to think through this. Um, and um, just uh, by way of introduction, real quick, uh, my name is Matt Borja. Um, I am a software developer, software guy, I guess you could say. And um, I do also understand that uh, this is time out of your guys' day, uh, come from your, your responsibilities <clears throat> um, and the things that you have to do. So I do recognize and appreciate that again. Um, I also uh, understand the value of having an excuse to get away from all the madness that waits for all of us back there when we are done here. So uh, you're welcome. Um, before we get into it, I do want to just kind of get an idea. I know that we are uh, doing a little bit of recording and I wasn't quite sure what the audience was gonna look like, but I do wanna kind of get a pulse for um, you know, who's here. And uh, so maybe if we could just start with that, give me an idea of uh, yourself. Um, so just your name, first name, um, your field, your industry, okay? And then uh, what your role is in that industry, okay? So your name, your field, not necessarily your organization, but the field that you're in and then uh, what your role is in that. So go ahead, let's start there. I'm Shelly, I'm a librarian here at the college. Okay. And what was the last question? Uh, just your field and what your role is. And my role, I'm the manager of public services. Manager so, of public services. Yeah, taking okay. care of everything front facing. Awesome, cool, thank you. My name is Carrie. I am also a librarian, uh, but my kind of area is with open educational resources. Okay. So helping get the digital resources mm -hmm. that are open access for faculty members and student access. More, more accessible, more just, okay, cool, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Zeke, and I am. Uh, I work here at Yapai yeah, College in facilities. I am the custodial manager. Custodial manager. All right. Thank you. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah. I'm Ginny Bilbray. I oops, Ginny, just Ginny. <laughs> I work at the Yapai yeah, College Library, okay. and um, I work in government documents and archives. Those are my specialty areas. Cool. Very good. All right. Yeah. Great. Um, and again, my name is Matt. Um, I. My my place, my role, my field, um, my industry right now has been in education, has been there for a while, but my field is in the area of software development, software engineering. Last year, we did a session on applied principles in software engineering. That's kind of where I lived for a while there. Um, and uh, some of the things that I do in that field, you know, uh, I could go into a lot of it. Uh, yeah, writing software, I do that, designing solutions. Um, I manage infrastructure, manage operations, um, you know, things with having to do with single sign-on and infrastructure, high availability infrastructure. So, you know, we can bring down servers and bring up servers and do things in, in that way. It's all great. Um, and I had transitioned out of the open source world um, back in 2013, having taken this job uh, to come work for the college. It, it was something that I aspired to do or to become in my field when um, I saw an opportunity to, to, I say, I use the term enterprise because of the, the nature of systems and the environment that we work in. Um, you know, before I was working on building like one off applications, like software products, web services, or web, web applications. When you get into an enterprise like this, whether you're small or big, you find that um, the way that you do things, the way that you build things is really um, contingent upon how, how it affects everybody else around you, how everyone's stuff plugs into your stuff, how you plug into theirs. And, you know, very simply, um, and just as an example, you know, you go to build a, uh, let's say a tennis court reservation system out in the open source world or out in the world that I came out of, you just build everything there and you have your user database there and your password hashed there. And that's where you store everything is there. It's nice package. You come into an enterprise environment like this, you, you don't write your user database, you use somebody else's and you have to learn how to plug into that. And by the way, there's a lot of policies that govern how those user accounts will be available to you. So it's a whole nother level of 
um, just engineering and design and architecture that, um, you know, that's my field. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in thinking through this a little bit and working over the years, that was back in 2013, I made that transition. Um, you know, something that I really came to enjoy more, I think, and I learned this about myself over the years, especially with COVID, this really brought it out in me, something that I didn't really understand about myself up until recently. And that was that how much I craved being around people, I which I took for granted, you know, when you're working in the office and you come in every day and you say, hey, you know, Kip, it's good to see you. How are things going? And you share a little bit of your story and, you know, how things are going with the family and um, even a little bit about what's going on in, in that person's work world. You know, yeah, I'm, I've got these things to update today. I've got these things to deal, deal with. Um, it's not going great, but, you know, we'll, we'll get there kind of thing. And you share that. Um, and I took that for granted because, you know, I always we always had that. No questions asked. That was 2013. Fast forward to 2020. And that was that seven years. My goodness, that all got, you know, stripped away. Um, <clears throat> and but that was the thing that I so then after 2020, you, as we as we know, with COVID, um, that's when we were sent home. And I, you know, you begin to feel that pit in your stomach, like something's not right. I'm missing something. Um, and I learned over process of time that what I was missing was where all the engagements I had with my stakeholders was being able to go to their offices and sit in their office and talk with them and, you know, share with them. And, you know, to a degree that no amount of electronic communications could ever hold light to, you know, you sit with them and you see on their faces, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the things that drive them crazy about technology and the things that you are, you know, even responsible for, and you learn about the pain points and it's, you know, it's, it's different than, than on, on the computer, um, having th this discussion with people, it's this heart to heart conversation about things that affect them, affect their area, things they care about. You read that much more to more, um, intense, uh, I guess, uh, level, uh, just being there with them in person. And I found out that, wow, I miss, I, I miss that. <laughs> And it made it all the more worse when they started retiring and they started leaving and they started moving out of state. And I said to my boss that year in 2020, I said, you know, if we're not careful, I think the way that we're changing things right now, we're making a lot of infrastructure changes that are going to be practically even financially irreversible when it's all said and done. And things will stay this way. If, if we don't take, you know, and kind of the response was, yeah, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Well, guess what? That bridge never came. And I said to him this, to, I said this specifically, I said, if, if we're not careful and the way things are going, if my mind is following this logically, the way that this is going, I will probably never see this guy again, ever again. I will probably never, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And sure enough, 2020, that March when we all got sent home, that was the last time I ever saw him. And he no longer works for the college. And this person over here retired, and this person over here retired. And these people moved out of state. And I don't see my stakeholders anymore the way I used to. Well, you say, well, there's Zoom. But it's not the same. It, it, it really is not the same. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll push this point right now. You know, I understand that, and I'm saying this facetiously, but that, you know, divorce is an industry accepted standard for most marriages today, because that's just like, you know, but when it comes to visiting with your kids, you tell that father, you tell that mother, oh, Zoom's good enough. It's just the same. It's not the same. Okay. It's not the same. And why is that? Um, library, library, custodial. Welcome, Thatcher. Would you, we did intros as we came in. And uh, just ask real briefly, name uh, your field, not necessarily the name of your organization that you work for, but the field that you work in and what your role is in that organization. If you want to share real yeah. quick. Hey, everybody. Oh, hello. <laughs> I get the mic. How fun. Uh, so, I, uh, and I'm the director of the TELS teaching and e-learning support. So I'm in the area of online support for students, you know, faculty, students, and staff, and um, training in that area, uh, dem on-demand support, um, working with the systems, working with you mm -hmm. on projects, um, 
and other teaching um, ideas. Great. This thing I'm going on and on about um, just, you know, what it did to me and, and what I felt feel like we've missed and what we've really not been able to restore even to this day in that area speaks to something that we all share here, which to me speaks to what we share in common when we have people in the audience who are coming from the library, who are coming from tele-support, educational online services, coming from custodial, coming from software engineering and, and enterprise stuff. It's like, you put these people in a room, you know, they're not, their fields aren't related. I mean, yeah, they work on the same things, but like what unifies them? Why, why do we even care to be here? What is, what can, what do we share in common? And what that is in each and every one of us, just as it is um, a part of reality, a part of our existence is our human spirit. It's that which we, that enables us to relate to each other. That it is that which enables us to feel for one another to sympathize with one another, to empathize with one another, to connect, to be there for each other, to support. And we use this term called camaraderie, okay? And, you know, when I think of the word camaraderie, I, I think about, number one, what we lost here. I think about soldiers in the trenches and how horrible it is to be in the trench, be in a, in a war zone, and shells are flying and, and people are dying. And, but what continues to sustain that spirit, that, that force, what continues, yes, the mission, yes, their duty, yes, their obligation their, to their country and to their commanding officers, but what keeps them going? What, how are they able to support each other? You know, that camaraderie that is developed, that thing that is shared in common, you know, when they are able to speak into each other's spirit and to encourage each other. <clears throat> and that's... Really, that human spirit is a focal point of this lecture here. When we talk about excellence, which we talked a lot about in our last session here, um, last year in February, it's funny because it was the same month, the same week. We talked about concepts, principles, theories, techniques, and tools that can be used for developing high quality professional software. And that's where we set the target. That's where we set our objectives. We rejected idea, ideas of mediocrity. We rejected you know, just what we, we called out this idea that, you know, you will perfect what you practice. If you practice mediocrity, that's what you get good at. If you practice excelling to the top of the mountain, um, which by the way, we have no guarantee that we'll ever make it to the summit. You know, that's what you'll get good at. You will get good at pursuing excellence and as if it was muscle memory. <clears throat> now, um, and that's, that's full disclosure. That's where I live. Um, you know, in my, for a number of years here working at the college, um, I was basically the web developer, the web guy, the guy building this, the, the, you know, these, these different applications, fairly content in it. Um, and then, you know, there's this idea coming along that, you know, um, we need more people and, you know, Matt's been here for a while and uh, long story short, you know, um, I'm called into the office and I've, I've now been declared a supervisor with these two other guys that I've been mentoring and, and training up. And I mean, sidebar, I was like, uh, wait, I was supposed to talk to you about this before we did this because <laughs> I was intimidated about being a supervisor and the responsibilities that that would entail. Um, I knew how to manage my liabilities and responsibilities as a developer, but as a manager, as a supervisor, that was a different world for me. I had never been in that setting before. But however, I understood the, 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 I mean, I understood the degree, the severity of this, that I was now responsible for these two, training these two up and making sure that this was a good return on the college's investment. And so we went to town, you know, and it is within me to, 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 it was within me at the time to push and to drive and to train them and to help continue to bring out the value to back into the college that they had invested in me earlier on. And I won't get into all the details, but the college had invested, you know, for me to go to do some training. And I had uh, that, that enabled me to write really good software here. Like the kind I dr only could dream of back in the open source world. Now I was writing on Microsoft technology, uh, which 
you know, it was just everything I could do to keep my head above water in that training course. And I wanted to extract that and, and instill that into these guys. And I mean, best practice, best practice. It, it got to the point where it's like, my guys would ask me a simple yes or no question. And I would go on for the next 15, 20, 30 minutes on why we do what we do and why. And so to bring about, you know, long story short. So the answer is yes. Okay. You can just have said that <laughs> to, to begin with. Okay. Um, and if you went, if you were working for me at the time, um, you know, and, and this is really more replay of what they said, um, you know, you, you would have been in an environment working under me, you, you know, you would have said of me, you know, Matt, you're a friend, you're a great boss. Um, you care about us, you invest in us, you, you guide us, you help us to understand our jobs. And, you know, um, uh, th these nice things that were said, these good things, I think that we were, you know, we had come to a, each with each passing day, we come to an understanding, we had come to through these stages of team development, through the conflict stages, through the development stages to, um, you know, really start to take off in our production and, and you know, setting up, set, setting that being poised for the future, if you will. Um, you know, and and there had been some some life un, unfoldings, unravelings that had happened in my life. Um, twenty twenty is when um, you know I had gone through a, a just a, a mind numbing divorce myself, and yet I had to continue being there for my guys, and I had to keep supporting the mission of the college, and I had to still keep giving my hundred ten twenty percent. Um, well. Um, come back from FMLA, four weeks of FMLA. My therapist said, you know, you probably should have taken FMLA sooner, but you finally did, good job. And um, turned out my employees are being reassigned. And then I was also on my way out, not leaving the college, but also being reassigned. Um, after the stretches that we have made, after the progress we have made, um, after the work we have done for the college, after all these wonderful things that we have been through, and developing and taking form, these things were now being taken away. These things were now disappearing. That hit home for me very hard. What am I doing wrong? Because you go around and ask, and, and I hear this, and, and you know, I go back to these sources of affirmation and talk to these managers and talk to my VPNs, like, what am I doing wrong? What's wrong? You know, and people say of me, Matt's, uh, uh, chart, Matt's records are off the chart. That's what they say. And they, he does great work. So then why is this all being taken away from me? What is wrong with this picture? And trying to be mindful of the time. Um, this slide here um, illustrates for you, best way I know how, um, what life looked like for me on the inside, what I always strove for and try to instill into my guys. This is a very simple diagram, but we see here a very well-designed, well-formed diagram. It's a very simple, it's something I would say that characterizes my goal of simple elegance. It's simple, it's easy to understand, but it's very elegant and it's very functional. It's a lot, this actually has a lot of meaning in it. See, because these shapes are all the same size and they're all the same thickness. They're presented in a very consistent manner. They're organized, they're spaced perfectly apart from each other. Things are neatly organized, things are aligned, things are predictable, if you will. And as we go from left to right, from one circle to the next, we can see that things are also connected in a very sensible manner. One thing relates to the next, one thing connects to the next, and you can almost predict what the next node on this chart will look like, what it will be. This gives us a sense of comfort, this gives us a sense of peace of mind that things are sane, things are normal, things are as they should be. And even when we have a change in this graph, as we go from left to right, you see that it's the same circles, but now they're a different color. But it's not just this off the wall color, it's a color that we can appreciate. There's been some improvement introduced into this change. It's now gone from white to this yellow that we can appreciate. This appears to be an improvement. And these yellow colors uh, uh, are meant to represent that improvement, but not only have we changed states, we've not only improved the current state of things, but we've also, um, we, we are also now seeing a, a multiplication of results here. 
we're starting to see that we're not just producing one thing and then the next thing in a linear fashion, but we're starting to multiply our efforts. We're starting to scale. We're starting to um, really go places. And, you, and, and as this thing continues to split and continues to split, it'll only do so in a logical manner, manner that makes sense to all of us that we can appreciate even though this is a deviation, this is a deviation in our trajectory that we can appreciate. And this is what I pushed for in our area. This is where I lived in my head. And, um, but, then, but then we come to this thing called reality. Um, and, it, and it's not quite, quite like that. This is just another visual of the same thing. When we talked about excellence last year, it was about high quality going to the summit, top, going to the summit. But as I did, and as I continued to push myself there and continue to live there, I was noticing that there was more and more distance. And I didn't notice this until afterwards. I didn't come to reckon with this reality until afterwards, that that is not where everybody lives. Not everybody lives at the summit of excellence. Not everybody lives on top of that mountain. Okay. And this isn't to like exalt or elevate myself above everybody else that I worked with. This is just a simple reality. And, and there's a reason for this actually being a reality. Um, it has to do with further back here. This isn't a laser pointer. I don't know if it is, but it has to do with further back here where the graph actually starts. Because see, we don't all start in the same place. We don't all start messing around with computers in grade school and looking inside and say, Ooh, what, are, what is all this hardware in here? We don't all start <sighs> time tripping myself. We don't all start in sophomore year of high school with a TID3 plus graphing calculator, do we? We do. Most of us do. But not all of us are playing Super Mario on our TI-83 plus graphing calculator. Not all of us are sitting at the library, spending their entire lunch break at the library, downloading basic programs and assembly programs, ASM, assembly programs, onto floppy disk to sneaker net them. You guys know what sneaker net means? Some of you do. Sneaker net them back to my house where I built and soldered a TI graph link that connected this little stereo jack at the bottom to the serial port on the back of my desktop computer at home, running the TI calcs, those programs and uploading those programs from my computer to this. And that's how I was running some crazy stuff on here. And everybody's get done with their tests and they're messing around and I'm playing Phoenix Space Invaders on here. And they're like, Matt, what are you doing? But, and that was all back in sophomore year of high school. Sophomore year of high school, I was writing Visual Basic programs and desktop applications. And you know, my by my junior year of high school, I was already knee deep into cybersecurity. And talking with this kid who was just insanely crazy smart and scary smart, they say, with this stuff. And, and that's when I started learning Linux and getting into you know, um, Metasploit and all these things that it's just like, I can nerd out up with you guys about that all day long. Point being, I started way back there and I began to under, you know, and work with that stuff and stick with this stuff. This, this thing makes me happy, by the way, just so you know. Um, that's why I bought it on a whim yesterday. Um, and uh, that, that's the reality of excellence, folks. We don't start there. Excellent people who, uh, you know, exemplify and, and put on and demonstrate excellence. They don't start at the top of the mountain. They start at the bottom. They start a long time ago. And I mean, suffice it to say, just honest self-reflection with you. I look back at the things that I tried to instill in my guys. And it's like me trying to instill a lifetime of training because I had grown up with this stuff into these guys in a short amount of time, like a six month period in the form of a progression plan. It's like, you need to do this and you need to follow these steps and you need to take the same path that I took because I care about these things and this is why you should care and all of these things. It's like, that's not where they live and that's probably not where they're going either. That's probably not where they're headed. That's not what they get excited about. And in, in, in even more practical terms of reality, okay? Oh, yeah, this is, this is the uh, one aspect of this excellence-driven mindset is exclusivity it really begins to put some distance between you and the people that are on your bus that you're driving and you're trying to meet these marks. The elusive part to this is that you are setting goals that are unattainable. They're unrealistic for the people that you're responsible for. If you don't check this right here. 
this is what reality actually looks like. For a lot of people, for a lot of us, COVID, it's not well laid out. It's not well formed. It's not predictable. It's shapes that are not the same size, not the same color. I don't even know what that is in the bottom left corner. It's a notebook in the middle of it. What is that? A fried egg on the notebook and a choo-choo train. And that's not even a line. That's more like a wedge. It's like, well, what this slide doesn't make sense. It makes my eyes hurt. Well, that's what life is like a lot of times. And this is actually where we live a lot of times. This is a box. All of this stuff is in a box. The box itself is the only thing here that looks like something resembling sanity, if you will. But that box that maybe characterizes formality, maybe characterizes pretense, maybe characterizes, you know, things being in order when it's really not on the inside. It's just filled with chaos sometimes. Sometimes it's so filled with things, challenges in life that are holding us back that is making it very, very difficult for us to do our jobs, for us to have our heads in the game, for us to really, and that's reality. So then as you come to terms with this, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta stop driving long enough to see this, to turn around and see where your people are at. And through this process of, you know, having lost my employees and having my role be redefined and, and transformed into something else that I just really wasn't, is different, today's different. I had to ask myself the question, I had to reckon with this, like what went wrong? What, what did I not see? What, you know, cause I'm always talking, you know, what is in the best interest of, of the organization? Why am I not okay with this? Why can't I be okay with this? If this is truly what's in the best interest of, of the organization. And I, I think that for me, if I'm being honest, is that I was setting a direction and, a, and, a, and objectives that either one were unattainable, you know, they didn't start where I started. Um, perhaps, you know, they could have been attainable, but it would have taken years to get there, not months. And it just didn't fit the agenda or the direction or the priorities of the college maybe at that time. Maybe, maybe there were things, maybe I was on that summit alone by myself and I just needed to take a little more inward look at where we were really at. Those of you in IT watching this now, you know what that means coming out of ITIL training, starting where you're at, you know, but then being, being very mindful of how you are guiding and progressing the current state of things in, you know, um, to where you want to be. We talk about SMART goals. What are they specific and measurable, but then also what? They have to be attainable have to be attainable. And sometimes that has to come, that, that attainability, if you will, comes with a necessary self-evaluation assessment. What, not just where am I at, but what are we really truly capable of? What can we really get done with the resources that we have? And so graduating from last year's lecture on excellence, we move off that summit to try and be a little bit more realistic about our expectations and where we need to be to truly move things forward in a good way. And we see that these three arrows here that were originally there before, they end at the same exact point. They've not changed. And this is just my conceptualization of it, but the perspective of them have changed. They're now yellow, they're not red. It's not a bad thing that they are where they are at. It is not a thing that merits uh, probation or, you know, like derogatory remark. And I never once penalized my guys, uh, you know, you, you go and talk to them. Um, you know, they, they, they love their jobs. They loved me. We loved what we did. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but my perspective of them, you know, uh, also I think needed to change. Like, is this something that we really should be doing? Is this a direction we really should be going or should we maybe be recalibrating our thinking and our expectations a little bit, starting with myself? Now, that's a meeting in the middle kind of idea. And that's not, an, nothing I'm giving you here today is anything new, I understand that, but let's take a look at what the, where this arrow goes because this is now where a real, our perspective about this other alternate uh, discipline begins to take form. This is a simple line chart on the vertical y-axis is your 
uh, perform is labeled performance, X axis labeled time. Okay, and this line will continue into this. So we've got kind of a line chart, okay? Perspectives over time, performance over time. Just give me a couple, just a minute here. Give me your perspectives on this line chart, given what we've already started looking at and talking about. What are some perspectives? What are some things that you can comment on about this chart? Got burnt the, out going yeah, downward now? Something happened there. Yeah. Some, okay. Yeah. Maybe something happened there. Is that so? We are on the, we are acknowledging this downward decline in this trajectory after having accelerated and now we're going back down. Could it be possible that we've met our goal? You've met our goal. Okay. And so now we're going down to find a new goal. Maybe, maybe we are shifting priorities. Maybe we are um, in a down, you know, downtime, down space. That's fine. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Any, any, maybe one other thought, one other perspective. Go ahead, Zeke. Maybe just get complacent and just get uh, used to things, how they're going. And then, and then, yeah, don't pay much attention. Then things just fall off. Sure. Maybe kind of getting burnt out, getting complacent. Um, yeah. There was a uh, high demand. So performance mm -hmm. had to go up to meet mm -hmm. the goals. And now, Coasting a little. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and augment this. And, and this is all correct. These are all correct answers, answers I was looking for. The let's go ahead and augment this this chart now with additional information. Now we've got some arrows all pointing in the same direction, but we got two obviously here in the middle that are coded a little differently. How does this change your perspective? What is now your perspective of this chart? It's almost counterintuitive to what we just had discussed before, because it seems like the area that occupies the center is being marked with this derogatory color, if you will. Go ahead. So perhaps the red is overperformance. Overperformance. Okay. Just, I mean, people are, I mean, they're like ducks on the pond with their feet moving real fast. Pushing too hard. Pushing too hard. Yeah. Spinning wheels, maybe. Um, Burn in more resources than is, than is needed. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Notice, all right, oh, this is great. Um, the perspective changes is here. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I do notice that the beginning arrow is lower than the end arrow. So mm -hmm. even though there's been this high trajectory and then it's come down, it's still higher than what it started out as. Sure. Mm -hmm. Not by much. It is a little bit, but but not by much. But yeah. Oh, I thought there's somebody else. Um, so here's where the perspective changes is about to take form here for uh, for us. <clears throat> the two notice the proximity of the top of the arrow to the line. Everywhere where the arrow is yellow, we say is a passing metric. It's meeting expectations at that line. As we go from left to right, then it's almost as if laterally, it doesn't matter whether you are high or low here. And again, I'm not citing this as industry like fact or industry endorsed fact. I'm, I'm illustrating for you the, the essence of this lecture and that is identifying something and acknowledging something I believe to be more than just mere excellence is in every place where there's an acceptable mark, they are meeting expectations. They are rising to this line. So it doesn't matter if you're on the left side of the graph or the right side of the graph or in the middle, that's what is fundamentally different between these red arrows in the middle and the yellow arrows on the sides. The two red arrows don't actually meet the mark, even though that mark is very high up there. If they did rise to the very top, they would be marked the same way. Okay, and this is the perspective change, is that as we compare ourselves laterally, even to ourselves or to others, this is the performance Matt used to do two years ago. This is where we used to be five years ago. This is what Matt used to output, but today Matt's down here. That's, from a lateral perspective, going to look bad. That's gonna look like this decline. That's going to look like this, you know, however, if we take this at a vertical perspective, okay, 
then the criteria changes. All of a sudden now we're accepted because we are meeting that line, even though that line appears to be much lower in some parts. What does that say of the line? And I'll just, you know, the line means something then in this case. Well, I'm curious of who's moving the line. That's a good question. These are extenuating factors, things that we have no control over. And that line is what represents our best on any given day. It's a self-accountability model. So, yes, go ahead. So is it a bad thing that the line comes down? I mean, we work very hard every day. We That's go right. home, we rest. That's right. And then we regroup and then yeah. we come back and do it again at a higher level or sure. a lower level. Sure. So it's just, it, isn't it just a normal ebb and flow of what we're capable of doing? The line is a normal ebb and flow of what you're capable of doing on any given day. Some days are better than others, aren't they? Some days are worse than others. Some days you're dealing with a mind-numbing divorce. Some days you're dealing with your car broke down. Some days you're dealing with my dog. I had to put my dog down and the kids are having a really hard time with it. And I'm having a hard time concentrating here. But I'm doing the best I can do. And some days our best looks like 25%. What's important is that we do our best, even in those low points in life, and that we are accepted for our best. And when you come into the space, you commit to give your best, to do your best. And that, be be that best belongs to you and no one can take that away. It's not right for somebody else to come in and say, hey, you're not doing the best you can do. If you're the one who knows what your best is, and on that day, they're the outsider looking into what's really going on in your life. You know whether you're doing your best or not. And then for the person who decides, you know, that's ah, good enough. I'm not going to do my best. That's where the red arrows are. They represent somebody who could be doing more, but are choosing not to. So there are two sides to this. It's the side that says it's the self-accountability model, which, by the way, I think would be the dream of every manager of the largest corporation in the world is for everybody to just take ownership and responsibility for their own work and to be doing their best and not for the manager to be going around micromanaging and inspecting and making sure, are you doing your best? Are you? It's like, it's, it's internal to you. That is what scales. Everybody can reflect on whether they truly are doing, and they know every instant of the day, whether they're doing their very best or not. And managers don't have to worry about that. I mean, that, that'd be, that'd be a dream come true right there. But, you know, so that maybe we wouldn't have all, all, you know, these different remediations, but that's where it starts with, you know, us doing our best, but then us also acknowledging and understanding, especially as outsiders looking in that some days, you know, if this person's coming in low, you know, um, we've got to kick it out of high, we got to kick it out of excellence gear to meet them where they're at and to evaluate, to assess if there's something going on, if, and maybe not even necessarily to prod or to pride, but just to show support and say, you know, you, you, you know, is everything okay? And start having those meaningful, intentional interactions with those people. I'll tell you right now without even, I mean, we don't even have to get to the end of this thing. Like that's it right there. That's the whole takeaway for this whole lecture is understanding that there's only so much we can do on any given day that our responsibility is to bring our best. Even under, but then accepting and, under, and recognizing that there are times when our best might be 25%. And it might be, and might sit there for a while while that person processes and gets through life and gets through the difficulties that they're having to deal with in that time space. Or consider the alternative somebody who maybe doesn't think about or want to think about those things and they keep driving, keep driving, keep driving, keep driving. That exclusivity consequence begins to take stage in the form of leaving people behind in the form of over i saw this recently i'm not going to go into details but i saw this recently where this individual was just excellence was taken off and they were not ready to take off and it it, it turned into this crushing load that nobody should ever have to endure you need to take a step back need to see that no matter where you are, even mountains have their low points. Doesn't mean that you aren't excelling to the top of it. 
wherever it, that line is. I wanted to leave you with some action items, some reflections and some action items. These do come out of the Bible, but they're very relevant for what we're talking about because these very same principles were recognized way, way long time ago. And this is a guy, his name is Paul. And he's, you talk to you know, people in the Christian world and ask them about this guy named Paul. Who is Paul? And they'll sit you down. They'll tell you about what a great person, you know, leader he was in all of this. And he was calling out something that people were also doing in the Christian world. They were pursuing this level of excellence that was causing people to other people to get left behind. And he was calling that out. And he said, even things without life, like this piano right here, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known? What is piped or harped? Okay, yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> you know, um, hopefully if you can't hear it for the recording, I'm sorry, but I'll try to make it, you know, just, so we can, under, we can, we can relate to something that, it, that has distinction, you know. What you don't want to hear is something like this. You know? And, and, and why is that? Because even though it's the same voice, the same sounds, the same instrument, if there's not a distinction, I mean, there's something that you can relate to, something that you can't, something you can understand and be helped by and benefit from, like beautiful music, we all know what that sounds like, and something that's not so much, okay? We're gonna choose this every time as people, as normal people, as everyday human beings, human beings, Nicole. Um, so he says the very same thing, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the, uh, to the battle? Okay, think Ulysses S. Grant. Um, if that his his trumpet man, his bugle man, whatever it was, gave an uncertain sound, and they were all supposed to charge on that sound, but it just fizzled out. What what? How is that going to be interpreted? How is that? Um, they're going to be in trouble. So likewise, he then says, "Except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air." He basically says, "This is no value." It's not going to do anything. It's not going to get us anywhere. For us to be so um, capable, but not relatable. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. I don't have it up here, but I was going to read to you the data sheet summary for uh, a, a chip that I've been spending a lot of time with this past week from microchip technologies that handles elliptic curve cryptography for digital signatures, signing verification. How many of you understand what I just said just now? You wouldn't understand if I read the data sheet. And yet these are the things I understand. And I'm like, how could you not understand that? That's on an executive summary level summary. Well, I'm a barbarian to you because you don't understand a word I'm saying, even though I'm using plain English. And likewise, to me, I'm, you're like, how do you not understand this? <laughs> you know, we can't relate if that's where we're living and we're not compensating. So then Paul says this to those people who were consumed and obsessed with that excellence. Even so, as for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, again, that the Christian context, that world, seek, says rather, that ye Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He says, come back down to where everybody else is at and conduct yourself in a way that actually helps the people that you are responsible for. And notice here in this text here, the word excel is not removed. We are not dismissing the importance of excellence, but we are changing our perspective of what, where, where we set that, how we define that excellence. And so he transitions the body of the reality of not being relatable into an action item for us that is something that we can all do 
and see and other people be able to derive and see that benefit from us. He gives this other example here. He said he really goes to town with capturing for us what excellence look like, looks like in that, in that context. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I do all these wonderful, crazy things and have not charity, I'm become as a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have not charity, that sounds like wonderful things to have, again, in that Christian context. But he's, he evaluates that excellence as nothing if he's missing one thing, and that's this charity. He says, and though I bestow all my goods, I give everything away to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, doesn't do me anything, doesn't do me any good. That's how he is assessing excellence against this other needful component to the human spirit that you and I share, that relatable part of charity. Charity suffereth long and is what? Kind. Charity envieth not. It vaunteth, meaning it doesn't puff up itself. It doesn't make itself out to be better than everybody else. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave itself like indecently. Uh, it doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't think, uh, thinketh no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It beareth all things. Surely a needful skill, just simply because of how much the, the weight of life is in our lives. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. It endures hardships. It endures the things that don't go the way that we would like them to. And it never fails. It again, he is calling himself out even, putting himself in that pinnacle of excellence and, said, and evaluates it against the action items of things that we can be doing to be of a better help and to, 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 again, edify each other, it never fails. Now, as I said, and, I, and acknowledge here for you, with you, that that's all in the Christian world context. I understand this is not a Christian world context that we're talking, and this is more of a professional work-related context, okay? Well, what did that look like? What did that look like in my area? What, did that, what does that look like here in ours? Is that, you know, I can read data sheets all day long. I can spend my evening hours and weekends pouring over cryptography and uh, writing hardware code and you know, microcontrollers and then take all that knowledge back into this professional context and be like, hey guys, if you're not up till 2 a.m. in the morning and pouring over data sheets, I mean, you're, you're missing out and you're falling behind by the way. I can set those standards and I can just show that myself off at that point. Look how awesome I am. And people would recognize the, the, the impact but the difference that it would make wouldn't be so much a difference. It would be more of what makes the distance than the difference. And so what is better is for, well, we're past good enough at this point. We're not, we're not interested in just being, you know, the red arrows. Oh, that's good enough. We are concerned with excellence, which is our best. Your best might be to be that industry leader in library services, public services, online educational support, custodial service management of a team. Um, and, and that's your personal best. But then comes reality also where it's like, okay, you do your best and you know that your best at home might be like, I, I might never get the opportunity to go and drive this far at work, but I can drive this far in my own personal life, personal development and things like that. But don't get so far in your mind off to the point where you can't make yourself relatable once again to other people, because this is what is more than just mere excellence, personal individual excellence. It's when we together can do our best, when we can foster that camaraderie again, when we can apply ourselves and the best that we have to, and, and even adjust the best that we have to bring in, and recalibrate it into something that fits together well and is relatable for all of us. And this is what enables us to achieve more than we could possibly ever imagine. It's our best together that is something more than excellence. And so that's really it um, to, to the point of what I learned. Um, I do just want to real brief, brief, briefly give credit to where credit's due. I've got a few minutes here, um, about six or seven minutes left. But... Um, <sighs> I, you know, in full transparency, this is not my original idea. This is not something that I would have come up with. 
as I illustrated for you, that this was none of this was even on my radar. Um, and, and that's why I kept driving what I kept driving. Um, this was brought about uh, in, by my, my worship leader at, uh, I, I play piano for, for Heights and he sat us all down for, for a team night, one night and something was changing in, in the leadership of, of that band. Um, and it was a, this perspective because the, initially the modus operandi was, and his name was Zach, great, awesome electric guitar player. Um, you know, our modus operandi for the longest time had been two core values, humil uh, excellence and humility, which to me are opposite ends of the spectrum. It's like, how do you have humility, a, a subduing of yourself and an excellence and achieving? Like, how does that reconcile? And he was transitioning us into a different, uh, I think, perspective that the team leaders were starting to see was more beneficial that we all came in with different levels of capability and what we could do and our best. These guys had grown up years and years prior on the guitar. I mean, they were hitting the drumsticks in, in their diapers. You know, they were so far ahead of me and I was getting stressed out. I, I felt like I could not keep up with this. I, I would never survive this. I told Zach, I said, you know, this would be a living nightmare being on this team playing in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And having to come keep up with all of you savants for musicians, like this is nuts. I said, if it wasn't for your grace, you allow me to be here. You allow me to do my best and you allow me to have a place here. And that's what this is about. He began to break down for us. What are all the things that characterize excellence, marks of excellence? So, and we all agreed with it and we all wanted that. We, can, we wanted to continue that. But then he hit us when we weren't looking and he said now let's take a look at this other column and he said our best he said label that out and enumerate for us what does it look like when we're just doing our best and sometimes it's what we talked about when our best is you're having a hard time getting through life right now and i'm making a lot of mistakes on the piano and i only had a couple hours to practice and this is not sounding what i know i've been known for back here laterally and he's like bring it. This is okay. It's creating space. This idea of letting our best be what drives us toward excellence, be what is accepted, be what is allowed, create space for us to share uh, with those of excellence. And those people of excellence, they, they're the ones that have it harder because they're the ones who need to come down to where the rest of us are at and say, hey, hey this is okay. You don't need to be where I'm at for you to still have a place here right? Isn't that what we want? A place of belonging. And so that was such an impactful thing to me. It really changed the way I even thought about how I needed to be interacting with my employees. I'm like, yeah, I need to, I need to kick this off high gear right now. And I need to back off a little bit, you know, and start having more relatable conversations, you know, not scrutinizing so much, not being too critical, not being too elaborate, not, you know, just find something that works whatever that looks like for you. So that's uh, where a lot of this come from. So, and, and um, kind of a little bit about my story. I wanted to share that with you here today. So any thoughts, questions before I know, turn it back over to the library. I have a notice and a question. So um, you've come to notice that excellence comes in all different forms and it, it ebbs and flows. And so what was the tape that changed in your head? I mean, we have the tape that runs on our head says, yeah. I got to do better. I got to do better. What was the tape that changed in your head? And what is your tape now? So the tape that was in my head was industry standards. This is where we need to be. And so let's get there. Um, really what, what changed it was that meeting that he had with us that night, which I, ha I personally could relate to was I knew that I was not where these guys were at. And I understood that this is a place that I would not be in if they required me to be where they were at in order to be here. And so I saw firsthand the space that it created for me. And then just because it was shown to me the difference, like the coming to terms with the fact that there's what I went through and other people are going through stuff too themselves. And they're not all, you know, it was just, being taught, being shown 
the 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 reality that of people's lives outside of this you know work context this formal context where everybody puts on the face and it's like there are things that affect that there are things that affect us there are things that bring us down just as i've been brought down and um to see to see that acceptance and helped me to see how i could help others to feel more accepted and how i was not doing that and that i think just spoke to me that hey you know you appreciate this it's time to kind of turn that out to others so i would add to that that our traumas yeah are part of our growth totally and we perceive the world differently having gone through them that's right absolutely